I want to share with you some of the work that we've been doing at UCB on clustering multivariate clinical patient trajectories with missing values and its application to clustering Alzheimer's disease patients. First of all, why are we doing this work? Well, one of our goals is to develop out to develop drugs that slow down Alzheimer's disease progression. However, a serious obstacle in the development of new drugs for Alzheimer's disease is that there is a very large heterogeneity in disease presentation and progression in all patients. Hence, what we wanted to do is to develop an informative stratification of Alzheimer's disease patients that could potentially help design more efficient clinical trials and improve disease management in general. For example, by allowing to focus specifically on fast progressives. There are, however, a number of complicating factors in developing such a patient stratification. One is that Alzheimer's disease progression is inherently multivariate. Alzheimer's disease and many other neuro neurological diseases are poorly described by single clinical outcome variables, meaning that for each patient, you actually need to look at multiple clinical outcome variables or disease scores. Two is that disease progression is monitored over time, so we're looking at time series data. And three is that clinical data sets typically suffer from many missing values. These three complicating factors imply that if we want to principally address the problem of stratifying Alzheimer's disease patients, that, we, that, that, that this actually translates into a complex problem of clustering multivariate typically short time series, often in the order of five to 10 time points with many missing values. And this is a pretty complex problem. In fact, no standard methods exist for this setting. So for addressing this problem, we use deep learning to develop a new method that we call Vader or variational deep embedding with recurrence, which we published at the end of last year. Here's a few slides outlining what Vader was conceptually designed to do. Uh, input data looks like this. So for each patient, we have multiple disease scores that are available over time. And now what Vega does is to cluster patients across multiple scores simultaneously, such that we would be able to, for example, identify interactions between the assessments. Now, what do I mean by an interaction in this case? Um, that would uh, for example, in, in this hypothetical case, it would be that group one shows uh, severe disease progression on score one relative to the other groups, but it shows less severe disease progression on score n relative to the other uh, uh, groups. So those are things that we might be interested in finding and patterns that actually would be difficult to distill from the data based on the analysis of only single variables. Okay, so that's what Vader was conceptually designed to do. Here's what Vader technically does. Now, for the sake of time, I will not go into any detail here, so it might mainly be interesting for people with some background in neural networks and variational methods. Um, however, for the sake of completeness, I, I still want to mention it here because it's essentially where the novelty comes from. So, at its core, Vader is based on an autoencoding architecture. Using this autoencoding architecture, it simultaneously learns the latent representation through the autoencoding architecture. It learns clustering by forcing the latent layer to be multivariate Gaussian mixture distributed. Um, this part is directly taken from a publication by Janet Hall, um, presenting a clustering algorithm called variational deep embedding. Moreover, Vader models multivariate short time series by adding input and output LSTMs to the autoencoding architecture. And finally, it imputes missing values as an integral part of neural network training by adding an imputation layer to the final architecture. It basically learns imputed values as parameters to the network. So that, in very brief terms, is what Vader technically does. Now, just taking one step back, this is the slide that I showed you previously with our main goal, 
uh, we want to develop drugs that slow down Alzheimer's disease progression by developing a stratification of Alzheimer's disease patients to help us focus on certain patient subgroups. Here's a high level overview of how such a stratification could help. So first, uh, we stratify Alzheimer's disease patients into clinically meaningful subgroups. After that, we want to identify biomarkers for those subgroups. And finally, we would ideally like to direct Alzheimer's disease therapy against a subpopulation, which we think from the analysis here is more likely to respond positively. More specifically, in the first step, we want to use Vader to identify progression types by combining multiple types of cognitive assessments that track disease progression. In the second step, we want to train a model to predict progression type per patient from multimodal baseline data and to determine in these models which variables were crucial for good prediction. Also, we want to make sure that what we found is not some artifact in our training data, so we want to validate on an independent external data set. Okay, starting with the first step, using Gator for clustering patients by disease progression. Uh, for this, we applied Vader to clinical data from the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or HAPI for short. More specifically, we used data on three cognitive assessments that, after pre-processing, were available for 711 patients across five time points. Um, these are cognitive assessments that are commonly used to track disease progression in Alzheimer's disease. Some important pre-processing steps that we took include aligning our patients in time with respect to Alzheimer's disease diagnosis and normalizing scores by subtracting the first time point and dividing by the standard deviation across patients at the first time point, um, such that you actually get a disease progression pattern relative to the baseline that is normalized in the range across patients. Overall missingness in the resulting data was 47%. So we ran Vader on this data set and after carefully optimizing its hyperparameters, this is what the results look like. The three cognitive assessments, assessments each in a different plot, uh, they're called CDR, SB, ESC, and MMSE, uh, without going into any details as to what that exactly means. Uh, time in months is on the x-axis, assessment score is on the y-axis, and patient mean trajectories are plotted by cluster in each of the plots with a 95% confidence interval. The mean trajectories indeed seem quite different. Interestingly, these clusters that we found um, in the last slide uh, do not seem to associate with typical confounders such as age, gender, and education. So, so somehow we are finding a clustering here that's independent of that, which in itself is interesting. Now, having this clustering, we asked the question, do the patient subgroups or clusters that we, uh, that we found actually make clinical and or biological sense? So we compared the clustering to a wide range of other variables from HAPNI that were available at baseline. And yes, indeed, there is actually strong association of disease progression with these baseline variables. Uh, I show four examples here. Uh, so for example, uh, no, there is lower glucose uptake in the worst progressing cluster number three, known to be associated with Alzheimer's disease severity. Also, for these patients, there is a worse score on the cognitive assessment called trail making B, and there are smaller middle temporal gyri, which are certain regions of the brain. And finally, there are actually fewer patients with this particular SNP, a cluster number three, which is a SNP that is known to be associated specifically with progression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's interesting. We derived clusters based on multivariate longitudinal cognitive assessment data. And these results that we show you in this particular slide actually suggest that we might be, might indeed be able to predict Alzheimer's disease progression labels using only baseline data. 
So additionally, we actually compared this, this clustering that we found using data to certain variables that are available over time within that. And, and again, we can see strong associations with the more severely progressing patients in cluster number three, for example, showing poorer glucose uptake, smaller middle temporal gel line, more quickly deteriorating MOCA scores, which is another score for tracking uh, Alzheimer's disease progression, and more strongly increasing ventricle size is also known from the literature to be associated with Alzheimer's disease progression. Then, for the next step in, in our project, I'm coming back to the waterfall diagram. So, uh, the one that I showed you earlier. Here's what we talked about just now, so patient clustering and seeing whether these clusters actually make sense. Now, for the next step, we wanted to construct a model that can predict Alzheimer's disease progression type or label from multimodal data and baseline to identify biomarkers or variables that are crucial for the prediction and then apply the model to external validation data to make sure that we're not just identifying artifacts in our training data. I will be showing you some results, although these are not complete yet. Here's a slide outlining the general approach. We've got the ADMI data here, and the longitudinal cognitive, cognitive assessment data here from ADMI, and all other relevant baseline data here, also from ADMI. Now we use the longitudinal cognitive assessment data for determining cluster labels uh, for each patient using data. And then we use these cluster labels as class labels for training the classifier based on the baseline data. So given baseline patient data, the classifier will predict the data disease progression level. These are some of the first results for a, a grading booster trees classifier. Remember that I have three clusters, so I actually trained three classifiers. Uh, fast versus the rest so fast progressives versus the rest, slow progressives versus the rest, and a multi-class classifier, taking into account all the classes. Now what you see here is the cross-validated performance using 10 folds and 20 repeats. You can see that all of the classifiers show pretty good performance in terms of the area under the receiver operating characteristic, or AUC. To get an idea of what actually drives this predictive performance. Here are average shat values of the features in the fast versus the rest model. Uh, so shat values or, or shatly additive explanations are actually feature importance values that are estimated in such a way that the shat values for all features uh, for a given sample add up to the prediction value save a bias term. And each feature importance score essentially represents the change in prediction value when that feature is kept constant. Uh, and the ones that, just, that are shown here are actually the top 25. Because now there are some interesting ones here. There are quite some, some subcortical brain volumes that seem important. So we want at least three here on the other day. Uh, that seem important in distinguishing fast progressives. Um, but especially also these three are interesting, essentially to very specific questions from the ABAS assessment, a cognitive assessment score for tracking Alzheimer's disease progression. And questions uh, one and 13 seem very important. And also this is an area called uh, LDL, LDL total. Now, ABAS question number one actually refers to word recall where the subject needs to read and remember a list of 10 words and recall it at a later time. And question number 13, uh, refers to another cancellation where the subject gets a list of random numbers and needs to cross off each terms of uh, two given numbers. And in this third one, LDA or total or logical memory delayed recall, subjects are read a logically organized story and asked to recall it from memory after 20 minutes. Now, these three scores seem um, uh, quite specific in distinguishing the, the fast progressives from the rest. 
specific in the sense that we do not see these back in the, the classifier that was trained to, uh, distinguishing the slow progressors uh, versus the rest. Um, so in that sense, they're, they're, they're very specific for the fast progressors. Uh, what does seem quite specific for the slow progressors is actually this, this digit score variable where the subjects need to substitute digits with symbols given a digit symbol substitution list. Uh, also here, interesting here in the, uh, in the slow versus the rest classifier is that we uh, uh, see the, the tau variable popping up, which actually represents um, imaging of the presence of tau proteins in the brain. Tau proteins are known to aggregate in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients, and apparently a lower aggregates of these proteins in the brains uh, of subjects are important in distinguishing the slow progressors from the rest. So other than that, the features are fairly comparable, which is a bit more sparse. Now for the multi-class classifier, uh, you, can, you can see that they're essentially a mix of the previous two bar plots. You can see both features that are specific for the fast progressors, such as the ADX questions and LEVL total, as well as variables that are specific for the slow progressors, such as digit score and tau. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, this project is work in progress. And after training the classifiers, I showed you in the last few slides, the very next step consists of validating the model on, on the and then validation patient cohorts, which is work that's currently being done in collaboration with the Fraunhofer Institute for Algorithms and Scientific Computing in Bonn, in Germany. Um, and that was about what I wanted to share with you. So some conclusions. We developed a method for clustering all together short time series that we call variation and dependent with recurrence or behavior. Um, next point I actually didn't show you, but it's, I feel it's important to, to mention it anyway. We technically validated Vader and we found that it performed substantially better than other methods on both simulated and benchmark data. And also that Vader's implicit imputation actually performs substantially better than pre-imputation. Uh, then what I did show you is that we applied data to stratify patients by disease progression. Cluster mean trajectories were well separated and the clustering actually showed a strong association with, uh, with various clinical and biological variables measured at baseline. Then we developed models to predict these beta disease progression labels from baseline and achieved fairly good performance. Uh, what is currently still a work in progress is validation of independent data sets um, where we're specifically thinking uh, about using Admiralnet and uh, a core cohort called J Hatton in Japanese Hatton. Uh, finally, a point that I think is also important to stress is that Vader is actually a generic clustering algorithm. So it, it does not restrict itself in any way to patient data. It can be applied to any multivariate time series problem with or without missing values. <laughs> then for some acknowledgements, as I said, uh, uh, a lot of this work was carried out at UCB, but in collaboration with uh, the Fraunhofer Institute in Bonn and uh, Bonn University, and actually also uh, the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. Thanks for your attention.